coming up on Over a Barrel. There will come a day when those 299s uh, fade into the rear view. So, you know, kind of final call as Over a Barrel starts right now. Welcome to the program on Over a Barrel. Matt McLean with you alongside Patrick DeHaan. And yes, and Patrick, uh, for those who have questions uh, that maybe they would like to help participate in and ask us about some different topics and stuff, folks can get a hold of us uh, by going to podcast at gasbuddy.com. And I know over on X, you have uh, some ways of contacting us as well. Yeah, that's right, Matt. With uh, spring just around the corner, get those questions blooming. Uh, and yeah, to your point, over a barrel show on Twitter, you can reach me at Gas Buddy Guy on on X or Twitter, and uh, you can reach you at Over a Barrel Matt. Is that right? Over a Barrel Matt, and of course on Facebook at Over a Barrel Show. Uh, see see how see how complimentary we are. You say Twitter, I say X, and we both mean the same thing. And, you say and, Twitter, I yeah. say X. Exactly yeah. right. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, and then probably by this spring, summer, or fall, they'll change the name to something else, and we'll we'll throw we'll throw another name in there. It'll be great. It'll be great. Yeah, exactly. So, so stay on top of all our name changes right here on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, now that we've got some of the ways to contact us out of the way, let's get right on into it uh, with gas prices. I'm not happy. I'm just going to be really honest with you. They prices have really been going up uh, over at least in my neck of the woods over the past several days. Uh, I've even seen 309, 319 a gallon, uh, whereas just 14 days ago, I was paying like 259 a gallon. So talk to us. What in the world is going on? Yeah, you know, give us give us your frustration, Matt. I'm really feeling the energy Let you know how here. I really well, feel? <laughs> exactly. Let's tear into these higher gas prices. Well, you know, first and foremost, let's start out with a little bit of good news is that, you know, the last week uh, after we spoke, the national average did keep going up. It hit $3.30, which, by the way, for anyone who is keeping track or a scoreboard at home, that's a 27 cent rise from where we bottomed out. The, the official bottom, by the way, was 3.03 a gallon. That was... Um, Boy, just a, a few weeks ago, actually. And since then, we're up to about 3.30. But over the last couple of days, Matt, as, as I had mentioned on, on Twitter or X, whatever, <laughs> the national average has actually rolled back about three cents a gallon. So after hitting 3.30, we're now at about 3.27. I don't want to get too much into the details, Matt, but a lot of the reason that's happening is because those states that saw the big increases in the Great Lakes, right? Those areas that we have said uh, engage in what we call price cycling. Well, those areas are now seeing prices cycle lower. So those areas are pushing the national average down. Uh, interesting dynamic now is uh, we're still about 10 cents cheaper than last year, but we're still 19 cents higher than we were a month ago. So, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I did give my wife some uh, flowers for Valentine's Day, but they are wilting. And, you know, those low gas prices will be wilting in the days ahead. So if you have any of those two ninety nine dollars prices, and I think we said it in the last episode, by the way, I think the days are numbered, but but it doesn't mean every day, Matt, prices are going to go up. There will be some days here and there where we, you know, you might be out driving around um, spotting those gas prices for the Gas Buddy app, by the way, which we all appreciate yes. you spotting those prices. But <clears throat> there will come a day when those 299s uh, fade into the rear view. So, you know, kind of final call <sighs> as, as spring training lies upon us, by the way. And I'm, um, you know, the Daytona 500 was this week. Uh, you know, it did get rained out initially because of, of we took a, a, a soaking here in Florida. Um, and we did see a price jump, by the way. For any of those listeners in Florida, we saw most of the stations across the biggest cities in Florida jump up to 339. That was a bit of a surprise. Uh, excuse me, 335. Um, but, but you am, know, Matt, it's not good. Spring I, training and Daytona 500. <laughs> I do. I, I get excited for spring. Well, I don't get that. excited for what what else comes with spring, and that's you know feeling like I can't get a deal at the pump because I I myself the gas buddy guy got hosed by the increase that happened in Florida. I was not ready for it, and I am on e. 
Yeah, I'm actually on about a little less than a quarter of a tank right now. So I'm going to have to, as soon as we get done with this podcast, actually, I'm going to be uh, doing that very same thing and filling Dag up. Nabbit, and, I got stuck on E. Right. I got fooled. Yeah, I know. So then the question mark that I have is the price point that I am seeing for crude oil right now. And I recognize there uh. is some disparity between wholesale gasoline and and crude, but it seems to have gone up from this time last week and by quite a bit. Am I wrong? Is my memory uh, a little sketchy or You're what? scaring away the low gas prices. No, you're you're absolutely correct, Matt. Uh, we are actually hovering just under that $80 barrel mark. And by the way, for anyone keeping track of that, we have not seen West Texas Intermediate, which by the way, there's two types of oils, Brent and WTI. The price of WTI is just under the $80 barrel mark as I stare at it, $79.46 a barrel. That's a pretty key barrier, by the way. Not only is it uh, some of the highest we've seen since November, but Matt, we've talked about this a little bit. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is being refilled by the White House. Right. And they have said that as long as the price of oil is under $79 a barrel, they're going to continue filling it. Well, well, it's no longer under 79, is it? Yeah. It's a, well, look, it, it, it just ticked down a little bit. 79.34. Well. But Matt, this is one of those interesting days, too, where we could talk about this. The price of oil is up. Um, I want to see if the price of Brent crude oil is up. That's the international benchmark. Yes. No, Brent is down. Well, but Matt, it's up, but but it's it's up week to week, but down today. How about that? Well, let's and let's highlight this. The price of oil, uh, the West Texas Intermediate, is up just a couple cents. Ooh, look, it just flipped to a negative. Mm -hmm. Oh my 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 luck. Um, but what's more interesting is even when the price of oil is flat, the price of gasoline, the wholesale price, is actually down two and a half percent. So this could mean that instead of seeing the national average keep going up slowly by slowly by slowly by every day, we could get a little of a, uh, a break here over the next week or two. So, well, that's kind of the hope. Uh, yeah, let's, let, yeah. let, let, we want to give the listeners a little bit of optimism. So, Is there a reason know, to be optimistic? That's the question. Well, you know, it's I mean, we're not paying five bucks a gallon. But will we? <laughs> the answer to that is yes. no. Okay. I don't anticipate that we'll see five <sighs> bucks a gallon, Matt. So I unless you're in California, so, sorry, California. Um, by the way, California is already at 463 a gallon. <gasps> but Matt, here's the interesting thing. California is actually the same as they were a month ago. Excuse me, a week ago. Prices haven't really done anything in California. And the well, when they're already thing, that Matt, high, I mean, you know. Well, they've all, they, but they've already made the transition to summer gasoline in Los Angeles. And if I pull up LA here real quick, in February, the price of gasoline in LA is only up a penny in the last week and it's up 25 cents from a month ago. So interesting. It, they, they actually haven't gone up that much. I, I talked to a reporter this morning and they're saying, well, we've made the change to summer gasoline. When's the big price jump? Well, I mean, don't sneeze next to a refinery, but <laughs> You know, that's where we are for now. You know, don't. How, it, how do you make this? Uh, summer isn't until June. How did it's February? I mean, how did we get there? Uh, the, 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 the transition to summer already in February? That seems really early. Well, for, for California, Matt, keep in mind the EPA does not have authority there. It's the California Air Resources Board. And Matt, it's, it's, they're only six weeks away from the requirement taking effect. It starts April 1st. And that's at the pump. So I, don't, I want to draw a, a big difference to there are differences in the dates when it's required, Matt. Usually what happens is refineries change first before the pipeline specifications change. The pipeline specifications change. That's a big date. Right. Because, you know, uh, it's kind of like following a banana. Right. From the the what we'll call it the, the jungle, so to speak, the banana. Right. You have to time it. So it's in the store on the shelf and it's yellow. So what happens when you pick it? Well, you pick it when it's still green and not ripe. So that's kind of the same thing happening here with the changeover to winter gasoline is they're sending a product down the pipeline that's meant for use many weeks from now. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to fill up with it, it's it's ripe, so to speak. I see. So the, 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 the refiners are purging their winter gasoline. The, the, the changeover has to happen up the chain much earlier. Just like the reason, Matt, that retailers, they don't start stocking stuff for Christmas, you know, a few weeks before Christmas. They literally start stocking Labor stuff Day. for Christmas. And like, I, yeah, exactly, <laughs> I mean, exactly. Like I used to work in merchandising, by the way. And oh man, October was 
terrible yeah. because October is really when the, the run up to Christmas starts happening. What's the rule, Matt? I don't know. Is it two holidays in advance that retailers basically move? I was looking at Valentine's Day candy before Christmas. Yeah, so there it's it's two holidays. And by the way, for Christmas, they're like planning it for in July. That's yep. why they have Christmas in July is because yep. that's what they're thinking about. Makes sense. Makes sense. But so, anyway, so, you know, the summer gasoline changeover is already starting in California. Um, the, the deadline there, Matt, is April 1st. And for refineries not in California, uh, the EPA, the EPA deadline for the rest of the country is by May 1st. And then by June 1st, everything. that's the deadline for retailers. Gotcha. So, so they might as but, well. But, but, but keep in mind, I mean, it's almost March. And the way that pipelines work, Matt, is it, it, it can it can take pipelines a couple of weeks to send gasoline from the Gulf Coast up to right. New York. <clears throat> so that that's why these deadlines, that's why we're talking about them already is because at the at the refining level, refineries are already starting to think about the change, which is just it's imminent. Uh, and it'll be here before you know it. And hopefully so will the summer weather. But well, not the summer gas prices, we could do without those. That yeah, I definitely could do without the summer gas prices for sure. So I'm seeing wholesale gasoline prices uh, seemingly down about two percent currently. So yeah. I don't know if that's going to translate into anything. But I did, uh, as we have been talking, just send you a link to a, a story. I'm not going to cite the actual analysts that are in this story, and I'm just going to gloss over it. Uh, indicating, well, you know, you know, you know do you, and, and, do you and want this to? Interesting, I, I, you know, Matt, there, there's an interesting thing. If if you watch, uh, you know, I'm an oil analyst, gasoline, whatever, refined products analyst. If you watch these analysts, you know, over years, you'll know that hey, some analysts are permables, yeah. right? They're permanently <clears throat> bullish. Some are permanently bearish. So the fact that this one, um, I'll just come out, I'll come out and, and say what it is. That okay, uh, Citibank is mentioning that there's an off chance that oil prices could surge to a hundred dollars a barrel within the next 12 to 18 months. City tends to be a bit more reserved, meaning that they tend to be a little bit bearish. They, they are a bit more conservative. Um, you know, whereas Goldman Sachs, by the way, tends to be a little bit bearish, meaning that they often call for oil prices that are above, I think reality city would be on the most on the flip side. So, so, what so you this have kind to of surprises is, you in other yes, words. Okay. Exactly. You know, this is something to tune into and say, Hey, wait a minute. They don't usually come out and say that this could happen. So I think, I think they do have some positive points here to mention is that, you know, in the long run, Matt, um, OPEX production cuts, right? They've been going since last summer. Right. And with the economy continuing to increase, even, even with inflation, or I should say interest rates being elevated, global oil inventories have been decreasing. So this is something to keep an eye on. And by the way, I don't know if you read today in the Wall Street Journal, terrific piece about uh, the Saudis. Um, essentially, the Saudis continue to make huge investments. The headline, by the way, from the Wall Street Journal, mega projects in the desert mm -hmm. sap Saudi Arabia's cash. So I had actually had a colleague um, send this to me as well. I always love when, when colleagues send me articles um, that are pertinent. I mean, think about this. The, the, the way Saudi Arabia is spending money is well, a they're factor. building the line, which is the, yeah, and that's the picture of this article. By the way, is the <laughs> yeah. line, and and they're investing everywhere. Now, now I mean, they're they're, they're, Patrick, they're buying sports, right? And leagues, right? You know, so, so, so before we get into that, I I automatically in my brain just heard multiple people listening right now going, "What is the line? Do you want to explain it, or do you want me to?" Oh, no, no, you 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 go ahead. I mean, you're the you've been following this as well. Yeah. So I the the line is actually an actual city development. It's called a linear smart city um, that is uh, about 1,600 feet tall, a straight line that goes It literally for, looks like a straight line if you cross like LA yeah. to, you know, New York. It and, looks like a massive line. This one, this one building that stands 1,600 feet, feet tall. Think about what that that's uh, that's up there with like Willis Tower and in in Chicago and and you know Sears uh, Tower. Yeah, I call I, I <laughs> it's 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 I still call it Sears Tower off the air, but on the air, so to speak. I still I you know it's it's proper name now as Willis Tower, but or or some of the other really tall buildings. 
and this one building is 105 yeah. miles long. So you have, and, and is expected to house around 9 million residents. It will have no cars, no streets, or quote-unquote carbon emissions. Um, and it's currently under construction right now. So it, it will not have any carbon emissions, but there's sure a lot of hot air about this project. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. So that, that it, it, I mean, when you're building a building that's 105 miles long and 1,600 feet high... Uh, that certainly is not cheap uh, in <laughs> any way, shape, or form. Um, so that's that's uh, that's that's they're spending and a lot your, of money. And to your point, when the Saudis are opening their wallets for things like this development, um, you know, keep in mind, it's it's I I think this is a sixty two billion dollar giga project. If I'm not wrong, I could uh, be wrong on that. That sounds. Well, the line is planned to be the first development of a of a five hundred billion dollar project uh, as well. So is there? Okay. I did, well, in that case, maybe that that sounds a little low then. Uh, but the point here is, <laughs> yeah, is Saudi I think that's Arabia. Artificially a bit low. Yeah, Saudi Arabia and and their um, public investment fund, uh, the Saudi PIF, mm -hmm. is is they've been calling for the twenty thirty plan to manage up to two trillion in assets. So where this all comes in for, for, for us to wrap it up here uh, for all those who are saying, well, what the heck does the line and all these other projects are the Saudis are funding? What does this have to do with the price of oil? Well, well they're paying a for lot it. Of, well, exactly. The Saudis are paying for it. They're also going to be selling more uh, stock in Saudi Aramco, which is a state owned oil company in Saudi Arabia. The interesting dynamic here is that the more bills the Saudis have to pay, they're probably going to be in a tight spot. And this is why they are also pushing for a higher price of oil, because you have to think for a country like the Saudi uh, for Saudi Arabia that sells nine million barrels in the market a day. Um, you know, every every small increase in the price of oil, you know, if oil prices were ten dollars a barrel higher, we're talking about a ninety million dollar daily fluctuation. So, yeah. This adds up to be a lot. Yeah, and I will say some of the uh, estimates are as high as U.S. Uh, U.S. dollars, one trillion dollars to build this, which would make more sense when it's 105 miles in length and 1,600 feet high. Either way, should be quite impressive to look at. Uh, but beyond that, you're exactly right. They're using the oil money to pay for it, and there you have the pro the problem slash the benefit. Uh, but they've got a lot of they got to get a lot of oil out of the ground to sell it. I and and to and to build that thing. I find it quite unique that they're using oil money to build something that they want to be uh, emissions free. Um, that's that's an interesting concept to me, um, in, in my particular mind, anyway. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, and this is the interesting dynamic, and you know, it's it's something that's going to keep coming up, and 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 so it's really interesting because even stuff like this, right, which has traditionally not been something on the radar right has been something to watch because yep. the saudis are changing their you know what they're looking for what they're willing to accept because they have a lot of so-called bills to pay they have you know this 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 investment fund that they want to uh that they want to invest in all sorts of things right like sporting leagues and they they have a new state-owned uh airline matt that bought mm -hmm. 35 billion dollars in jets from boeing so you know, th this does factor in to things like our 2024 fuel outlook, and it's going to be a wild card moving forward, depending on how uh, MBS or Mohammed bin Salman, who's the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, how he handles, you know, these investments. So it's something to keep an eye on. But back to how that impacts prices here um, is that the Saudis have probably been contributing to under producing oil to drive oil prices up. And that's why Matt today we find oil at about $79 a barrel. So, you know, and that's why city is forecasting potentially a rise up to a hundred. So in that same article, they're also indicating that they believe gold could actually increase by 50%. It's currently selling at about $2,000 per Troy ounce. And now they're indicating possibly as much as $3,000 per Troy ounce. So I find that to be quite yeah. unique as well. Uh, that kind of concerns me a little bit, to be honest with you. Uh, that that makes me question, you know, what what's going on and and why. Uh, in yeah, in a, well, lot a lot of different of, aspects. A lot of, 
a lot of countries are um, accelerating their reserves. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the article specifically calls out China and Russia are accelerating their, their gold purchases. India, Turkey, and Brazil are also, they're increasing their purchases of gold. So, you know, um, the article goes on to say that the world's central banks have, have sustained two back-to-back years of more than a thousand tons of gold purchases. So, you know, it's, it's something to keep an eye on. And certainly for the price of oil, um, you, you know, the, the situation I mentioned, the Saudis are, are limiting output. <laughs> And that is pushing global inventories into a decline. And if the economy does start to, to, to fire back up here, Matt, if interest rates do come down, the number one problem or one of the major problems could be oil inventories globally are tight. And the Saudis will be sitting in a pretty spot if they have the ability to produce more. And they're going to be very careful tapping that, right? Because they don't want oil price to go the opposite way. For the <coughs> consumer, what does it mean? Not a whole lot yet. But it means there may be some clouds on the horizon down the road. That's the key is the clouds uh, or are the clouds, if you will. That's the part that has me wondering kind of what's, you know, it, it, the, your, your crystal ball that I always, uh, uh, you know, jide you on a little bit, uh, uh, chide you on a little bit. And, and my cloudy it, crystal ball. Yeah. Like, you know, it, it, there's <laughs> there's there's a lot there um, that's really difficult for someone like an analyst like yourself to try to to factor in and look at. And and I would think that at least a portion of it would almost at this point come down to a gut instinct more so than anything, because there are so many what ifs. And yes, we are in the middle of a presidential election year. I know that you, you, you religiously, <laughs> you religiously tell me uh, that it, you know, uh, historically speaking, presidential election years don't usually create a huge uh, upside or downside to the price of gas at the pump or oil prices or anything along those lines. But, and I'm not going to say I disagree with that or anything. I just am wanting, wondering, given all of the cumulative effects of the tumultuous craziness that we have going on across the globe, if there could possibly be um, every little, every little bit of uh, chaos or every little bit of, of concern or, you know, a jitter here and there. Um, do you think it could have a cumulative effect, uh, perhaps treating this year a touch differently than in previous uh, types of years like what we're seeing right now? Well, you know, I, 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 yeah. every situation changes modestly over time, right? And how right. we look back at these things, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So, you know, it, it's it's hard to know if this is really something to be, you know, legit concerned about and to what degree. I don't think it's a, a huge impact yet, but... As the economy starts to find its um, place again, uh, it could be problematic. And then, you know, if the Saudis don't want to increase oil production, well, then it's going to be a little bit easier to understand why they, you know, are acting the way they are. And that's because they have, you know, this 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 whole investment fund that we just, you know, talked about for 10 minutes. Uh, yeah. Th- th- they have that to deal with. So, so then the key he, he, is, Patrick, you look at all of this and you think uh, from a consumer standpoint, you know, a layman's terms, if you will, well, they've got this massive line city that's 105 miles long to, to, to pay for and build. Why wouldn't they be pumping out more oil to get more money so they could finance it and take care of it? Well, I think the Saudis realized at the end of the day, Matt, that y- you can't just dump, you know, more oil in the market without, you know, eventually the data will catch up to you. And we live in such a data-driven world, you know, companies like Gas Buddy and, and um, the company that owns Gas Buddy, PDI Technologies, data is what dictates a lot of business decisions, Matt. And so when the data inevitably shows that Saudi Arabia is pumping more oil or more oil is, is showing up, you know, in, in developed countries, it's going to push down the price of oil. Right. It's just a matter of time. You really can't hide the amount of oil you're producing from the global market. You might be able to say one thing and do another, but it will only be a amount of time, Matt, before that oil shows up in data. And if if suddenly Saudi Arabia is pumping more oil, that is going to have a negative impact on the price of oil, which is why they're being very careful and calculated with how much oil they're producing. They want to extract every possible dollar that they can. Out of out of your in my wallet, 
without pushing you and I to go, you know, to an EV or something else like that. So it, it, it's a balancing act. And for them, you know, they look at data too, right? What's because they don't, if oil goes up to $150 a barrel, Matt, and sets a record, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not going to be good for the longevity of, of no, oil prices. No, that right? makes they, me nauseous at my stomach, actually. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, at the end of the day, they, 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 there's this magic number, Matt, and it might be, you know, 80, 90 or a hundred dollars that you can you can keep consumers using oil if it's relatively affordable but if it gets too high people are going to start to look for replacements and that's by the way that's kind of the 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 catch-all here for evs is that consumers now have an alternative i mean how many alternatives were there 20 years ago it was that's very true it was a gasoline powered vehicle or maybe a hybrid or very few but very few hybrids uh, you know, right, tw- right, 20, exactly. 20 plus years ago, there were also very few hybrids as well. So the, the, the calculus has changed now for oil producers is they have uh, a little bit more competition in the form of electric vehicles to think about. So, you know, that 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 will probably guide the Saudis policy moving forward. Uh, but again, to tie it all in a bow for, for consumers, it's not going to mean a whole lot just yet. But again, there are some clouds in the horizon. But let's let's live in the here and now. Gas prices have gone up a little bit in the last couple of weeks. But. Uh, we're still a little bit lower than last year, and gas prices are still pretty affordable uh, given the the cost of living. Um, you know, compared to the CPI data, the uh, uh, core price consumer index. Guy. Yep. Yeah, consumer price index. Um, gasoline is still one of those things that's pulling inflation down for the moment. Um, but will that moment. will that flip uh, over the next several months, as is traditionally the case, as you have pointed out multiple, many times in the springtime prices go up? Do you foresee that flipping and suddenly driving uh, it, the price index up? It, it it could temporarily flip. There was a period like uh, last year, for example, Matt, the the wholesale uh, excuse me, the retail price of gasoline fell in late February from about 345 to about 332. But then starting in March, prices went from 332 last year to about 345. Then they then they then they had another couple of weeks of quiet time. Um, I do think that we will at some point this spring will probably flip occasionally to where gas prices are slightly higher than a year ago. Um, I think more often than not, I'm hopeful that that prices should stay a little bit below last year. But keep in mind, last year, over the course of the summer, Matt, from May, uh, my goodness, as an analyst, that was probably the most boring summer I've I've ever been a part of because between <laughs> May May nine, <laughs> Patrick being bored, I'm trying to picture that. <laughs> between get this, right? Between May nine of last year, the national average was three fifty. The national average peaked. June 10 at 3:59 and so for basically the entire well for basically the entire period from early May to mid well I'll call it late July July 22nd Matt prices stayed in a 10 a 10 cent range in the 350s <clears throat> so May June July almost 3 months that gas prices stayed in a 10 cent range I, I tell you what I mean as an analyst that just gets boring. Nothing's changing. The market's balanced. There's really no stories to tell. But what happened last year then is um, late summer, uh, all those refinery issues started to dovetail. There were refinery issues in the Corn Belt, and we talked about them. If anyone wants to go back and, and look at what you know we were talking about last year, refinery issues in the Corn Belt, and then it was refinery issues in California. And so the national average actually peaked last year in august and then it peaked almost at the same price in mid-september so again highlighting matt that it 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 it, there's seasonality here but a lot of this has to do with refineries when when a refinery goes down unexpectedly it's bad news especially if it's in the summer so let me ask you this factually speaking because i know that in politics you have both sides you know talking about how they will lower gas prices they will do this they will do that we have to do this we have to do that and so understandably the the general population goes well this candidate uh and or this party will will handle oil in this manner and the other party will handle in that manner let's just talk fact literal factual evidence is right now the u.s producing the largest amount of oil that it has ever produced before yes 
Yes, we are. We are basically, um, I wouldn't say we're significantly above records, but we're, you know, right now for the last call it two months, we've been slightly ahead of where we were just prior to the pandemic. But the thing is, Matt, that we're also now not seeing much of an increase, right? The the the, the recovery, uh, the increase in U.S. production is basically uh, dried up for now. There may be some incremental increases as we progress through the year and as oil prices perk up. But we've been stuck at 13.3 million barrels now for really the entirety of the year. So then the question mark that I have is, um, I mean, we're... Well, let me let me throw it this way. Back in 2008, for example, um, are, we were really not exporting oil. Are we exporting crude oil? Because I understand that we probably do. Do we even have the capacity refinery wise to refine 13.3 million barrels per day in this country? Oh, yeah. We actually still rely on imports. Really? It's. Yeah, it's it's about quality, Matt. The U.S. produces a lot of heavy. Oh, okay. uh, excuse me. A lot of light, sweet crude oil. Mm-hmm. And we need uh, refineries need it's, it's kind of like a recipe, Matt. You can have you can have a lot of one ingredient, but that doesn't mean you can produce the the recipe. Gotcha. Right. So the U.S. is one type of crude oil that we don't need as much as. So how do you you know, you get rid of the extra. That's why we export oil and we import more of the type of oil we need to make the recipe work. So the U.S. actually in the last week, if I quickly pull this up, um, data from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, shows that last week, uh, the amount of oil that we put into refineries uh, was about, if I can find the number here, 14.5 million <laughs> barrels a day. Now, in the summer, that number is usually, you know, closer to 16 million barrels. So, but we, we need we need different types of oil than what the U.S. is able to pump out of the ground. Correct, here. and gotcha. and we also the 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 interesting dynamic too, Matt, is is once once you know you you put oil into the refinery, you get things like gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, bunker oil, sulfur oil, heating oil, all coming out of the refinery. Some of that we export. So you could say that while we input you know, 16 million barrels a day, not all of that is used in the United States. A lot of it is exported because, and and, and by the way, I'll just throw the numbers out. Uh, we produced 13.3 million barrels a day. Mm-hmm. We imported last week 6.5 million barrels a day. Wow. But we also so we, export, okay. Matt, we export a total of 10.6 million barrels a day of oil and products. We exported Understood. 4.3 million barrels of oil a day. And we exported 6.3 million barrels a day of products. So like pro- when you say products, we're talking like jet fuel, gasoline, diesel, or what are we exporting? Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, the, 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 for exports, gasoline, ethanol, jet fuel, distillate fuel oil, residual fuel oil, and gotcha. prop- uh, propane and uh, other oils as well. So nat- there, there's a lot gas. of stuff in there. And and, and and that's that's what makes the world work is that you import what you need, you export what you don't. But we are still, uh, we're, we're basically a net exporter, but so we still we need imports to, try, to make everything work. So if we were to try to live off our own oil and our own oil only, we would create some problems when it comes to oh, like gasoline. It'd be hugely problematic because refineries are not set up to run as much of our own oil as possible. Gotcha. Um, so there are refineries, Matt, depending on where you're in the country, refineries have to input either heavier crude oil, depending on uh, depending on the refinery. Uh, and by the way, there's a number. It's called the Nelson Complexity Index, the NCI. Every refinery has an NCI um, number. Basically, the higher complexity the more versatile a refinery is. And some refineries have a very high Nelson complexity index. Some of them are over 16, which is very high, which means that you can you can um, make some really sophisticated and complex products. Whereas if your Nelson complexity is say like less than 10, it means you're kind of like 50 years behind. Right. Your, your refinery is not as sophisticated. It's not as complex and it can't produce as much of the vital products that we need nowadays. And that's the difference, Matt, is because every refinery has a different Nelson complexity number. Newer refineries or modernized refineries generally have a higher number 
and they can process more stuff. Gotcha. That's, um, I, I got to tell you, I've been interviewing you since late 2008, early 2009. I thought you had taught me everything you knew. And today I have found out you have not the done Nelson so. The Nelson Complexity Index. Oh, there's still a lot out there too. And you by have the way, taught in future me all episodes kinds of, of the show, yep. I would love to bring on you know, a, a chemical engineer. In fact, I do have somebody in mind. Hopefully he's listening to the program. Let's do um, it. Let's, let's bring on some guests that can get really into the nitty gritty on what you're filling your tank with. I'm very curious. Yeah, you have taught me multiple things today that I did not know, uh, and I'm very appreciative of it. So thank you very much for that. Um, prices right now, what are we looking at over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, Matt, let's put a bow on this. Uh, gas prices, I think over the next couple of days, we'll see the national average today take a bit of a break. And with today's decrease in wholesale prices, I'm hopeful that the national average may actually decline another nickel. But I do think that, you know, as we get to March, mid-March, that's when we really start to see refinery maintenance heat up, the chain over to summer gasoline. So by mid-March, I would expect uh, a broader increase, but maybe over the next week to week and a half, maybe some modest decreases. Mm, I guess we're going to have to leave it at there. Certainly, <laughs> I'll take any decrease we can get. How did they That's get a right. hold of us, Patrick? Yeah, they can reach us podcast at gasbuddy.com. Again, is our email. It goes right to me and Matt. You can reach us on Twitter or X at Over a Barrel Show, or you can tweet Matt or I. I'm at Gas Buddy Guy on X. Matt is Over a Barrel Matt. And you can check out our Facebook page at Over a Barrel Show on Facebook. We hope to hear from you soon. Have a good one. <laughs>